Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, the Housing First Subcommittee meeting has now commenced. It is August 29th at 4 p.m. This meeting is being held virtually due to COVID-19 to allow for social distancing and protect the public health. As we continue our efforts in meeting remotely, we ask all themselves until called upon to speak to avoid feedback and background noise. For those who have dialed in using the call-in number to unmute to speak, dial star six on your phone. Also, prior to speaking, please announce who you are to identify yourself. As a reminder, this meeting is we ask that you only use that function to request to speak or to announce that you are leaving the meeting so we can track the forum. Also, to comply with the state open meeting law, attendance and votes will be done by way of roll call using audio, not by using the chat function. Um, so, Tisha Tallman here. Mindy Bernstein? Here. Wendy Asher? Here. Okay, and then Mark Clark is not here. Uh, we can go ahead and uh, commence with a call to audience. You're on mute, Tisha. Any audience member um, desire to speak, please let us know. It doesn't look like it, so we'll go ahead and move to the uh, next agenda item, which is Anne with um, HCD, and she's the interim director. Anne, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thanks, and I'm happy to, if people have questions, so I know Brandy Champion came last month, I believe, here, and then Brandy and Jason and Austin, you've kind of all heard from all of them, um, and so happy to sort of talk kind of strategically how we're integrating some of the different work that's happening within our work. Um, but there are kind of two areas in particular that I feel like when I think about things that are keeping me awake that I thought might make sense for this group to talk about. But I'm also happy to kind of talk more long-term strategery. Of course, both of these are related. Um, but the first item that is fresh on my mind and you know, we had a really busy week last week and had an opportunity to talk with the governor. And this week we'll be talking with state legislatures. And I feel like, so Brandy's program, the Housing First program, when I first came to HCD a couple of years ago, we had two outreach navigators. So we had Cliff Wade and, and Robert. And today, um, and Brandy ended up coming, working up with the continuum of care and we took over, um, we had been right before I got there, took over as the lead for the collaborative applicant for the continuum of care. So Brandy came and today Brandy has over 30 employees and her program as she articulated really um, thoroughly they have the outreach navigation, including this new program they've set up to really support folks that just get into housing. They have the shelters and shelter operations. Um, and they also are working on the, the encampment protocol and, and those pieces. And so today she has over 30 staff. And so one of the things that's keeping me awake though is so much of the operations of oh, the, the shower program as well. So much of the funding to, to do all of those programs is temporary funding. So almost everyone that works with her is grant funded. And so I think about long-term, just thinking about how as a community, I, I'm guessing a lot of the nonprofits are in a similar boat with how much ARPA funding and CARES Act funding has been sort of coming through and sort of thinking from a coalition standpoint on how to think about more permanent funding sources to, to support those operations. So that's sort of big on my mind. Um, the second piece to that is 
I think one of the challenges we all know is not enough units to place people. And so thinking about in particular, permanent supportive housing and with the different shelter operations, how do you move people into more permanent housing that has wraparound services and really helps support them while they get into a, a more permanent um, solution for their housing. And then sort of the third area that I think um, can, I continue to think about is the, whether they're older apartment complexes that have been sort of naturally occurring affordable housing or some of the low income housing tax credit projects that are coming out of affordability or doing the qualified contract process. And so one recently was put on my radar that's in, it's two different sites. It's in Ward 3. Um, total, there are 30 units between the two sites, but they're um, permanent supportive housing sites where even though it's 30 units, each unit has four bedrooms. And so that's 120 beds that are, you know, sort of housing people permanently with housing that is in danger of being lost to the, to market rate housing. And so really starting to think through how do we, what can we do as community partners and, and coalitions to really try to prevent um, some of those projects like that one from really leaving. We need more per permanent supportive housing, not less permanent supportive housing. And so things that I mentioned to Ernesto and Ernesto and, and Tisha that I was really sort of contemplating when it comes to our housing first program and the work that we're working on now. Um, and happy to sort of go into more detail, but those are those are the things fresh on my brain. Wendy. Hey, thanks oh, for coming sorry. to the meeting, Anne. Ah. Um, so I guess our concern when um, Brand, I think her name is Brandy, came yeah. to our meeting last month and was explaining um, housing first. It wasn't consistent with my understanding, and it also wasn't really consistent with how she presented it to the commission overall. So, and I could be, you know, just out in left field somewhere, but my understanding of housing first is that part of the intention is actually to provide housing first <laughs> without a lot of requirements of program participation, et cetera. And it just sounded to me like the way Brandy was initially describing it, there were a lot of strings and it wasn't consistent with my understanding of housing first. So I think that was where my confusion came from. And um, I guess I want to hear, we invited you to sort of like sort that out a little bit for us, because I get that, you know, if people really are, you know, a uh, threat and dangerous and engaging in really um, unacceptable behavior, that there may be a basis for somebody not having to continue to have access to housing. But the preconditions for what people have to do in order to get the housing is where I thought the line was for programs that are being described as housing first. So maybe you can clarify that. And I'm actually, I'm happy to clarify that, but I have clarifications on the <laughs> first. So I'm curious in terms of sort of where you felt like the discrepancies where you just mentioned sort of um, in terms of getting into the housing but hoping you can sort of unpack that a little more in terms of the inconsistencies with the Housing First, um, what you heard in terms of what our Housing First program is doing and what you don't think is in line with what you heard. So what I thought I heard, and you know, other, other folks were there, so maybe they can chime in as well. What I thought I heard was if people don't follow the rules, and that was pretty broad, not necessarily, you know, dangerous behavior, but if they don't follow the rules, they can lose their housing. And yeah. my, my understanding was, you know, you 
you can still be using, you cannot be participating in social services. The whole logic of of calling it housing first is to provide that stability to people so that then they are able to get to a place where they're they're willing and able to access the services that may be available to them, but it's not a carrot and stick or a string attached to it. So maybe other people heard it differently than I did, but that's what I heard. That's super helpful. And one suggestion I could make um, that might, I'm, I'm interested in sort of, I know, I'm interested in having you all take a trip to one of the housing for shelters that that we're overseeing, because um, I think that in you know this subcommittee can plan a meeting at one of those shelters as long as we notice it. All right, we can sort of have a meeting there, do a tour, talk through um, at another time. But I think that's super helpful, Wendy. What I would say is it's a low barrier shelter. So by that, people can be using, people can, um, can have dogs, and there are still rules and regulations around that. And, and the intention there isn't to try to um, not include people and kick people out, but the intention is to help prepare people for when they are getting placed in housing and try to help teach. You know, if you're in a, we want to try to help people stay in their housing once they get it. So if they have a housing choice voucher and they have a lease, try to teach them the rules that Brandy enforces are, are more consistent with the rules that somebody, a landlord would have. And I think that there's a lot of flexibility there, but um, you know, in terms of aggressive behaviors, aggressive dogs, things that can create a real challenge is is where there are rules and regulations but i think i'm i'm sort of uh, continue to be impressed with how many people uh, are interested in um, stick, keeping in the housing and really trying to learn how to approach the housing for when they are able to go to the next piece um, so i don't know if that helps just you know helps at all that by and large, low barrier shelter, and also trying to make sure that for the other folks that are in that shelter and to help prepare people, she does enforce some rules and regulations, um, but in a way that's really, um, re I, the, the intentionality and support that they provide everybody is pretty impressive. And I'm not sure, Neto, if you, You've, you've been there in terms of the different sites, if you want to add in at all. What I'd like to add is that um, I, I can't recall at the moment, uh, last month's meeting, I did put the YouTube recording in the chat. But uh, Wendy and others, um, I've heard Brandy consistently talk about um, the low barrier shelter. And the only really rules that I hear her talk about are drug paraphernalia should not be clearly evident in the rooms that yes they there's no stopping people from using and they don't intend to stop people from using they just don't want drug paraphernalia to be uh out in the open if you will and uh and unruly behavior uh yeah uh for the protection of others but i really haven't heard her talk about any other uh rules uh and regulations um but again, for the purpose of uh, our meeting, um, I don't recall what she talked about last week, but the, uh, the recording is on the chat. And I do, I mean, yeah, I do see your hand. I, what's interesting, Wendy, I'm, I'm interested in sort of, does that answer your question and, and sort of hearing more in terms of concerns there? Um, but, but another perspective, we just over the weekend had a uh, community meeting for the new shelter that we're opening up in collaboration with Pima County. And sort of the first question, we walked through 
what we're doing, what the Housing First program is, all of these things. And the very first question was, you know, sort of this misconception that it's um, housing first can be a free for all and, and this real sort of fear that it's housing only and not providing people the, the services and the um, kind of more information that they need. So it's sort of this interesting trying to, to both um, allow flexibility, have it be low barrier shelter, and not keep people out while also trying to work within a dynamic where we also know neighborhood groups and community groups have other interests. So I, it's always always a balance in this in this job. You know, and and that is really helpful. And um, I I like the description of low barrier, <laughs> and I I you know. I own a house. I live in a neighborhood. I, I understand people's concerns about, you know, no, no oversight, free for all kind of circumstances. Um, but I've been working in at legal aid for a long time and have watched the evolution of um, the housing first model and that move away from lots of strings, lots of conditions, people being put out of housing because they're not they're not adhering to a whole lot of rules and regulations. And I, I, I get the idea that, you know, you want people to understand that, you know, if you do these things and you're living in um, a rental unit, you're, you're gonna lose. <laughs> you can't do that. And sort of that learning curve for people. But there was just something about the way it was presented last month by Brandy. And I, it, I, it just had this visceral reaction that it yeah. sounded like there were a lot more strings than what I thought the model called for. And then when she did the presentation to the full commission, it, you know, it sounded a lot nicer. <laughs> and, it's, it's, and that's really a horrible way to put it. But that's how it came across to me. It, in fact, it came across that way so much to me that I was like, I did a double take. I'm like, is this the same person? Yeah. And so, you know, I, one thing that I will follow up on and I'm taking a note, but Neto hold me accountable to this is how many folks have, um, have had to leave our shelters that, that left because of the rules and regulations. And I think it's really small. Um, so I think my suspicion, Brandy moves, um, the amount of shelters and sort of work she has taken on really quickly. My suspicion is she probably overstated the rules and regulations and just sort of moving from thing to thing. Um, but that's one thing. We'll see how many people have actually been made to leave, um, since the shelter opened up about 18 months ago. Now, Wildcat's about almost 18 months and, and maybe so the reasons that they were made to leave yeah. that would be helpful as well yeah we can totally follow up with that and then Thanks like i said answer. i also between wildcat and now amazon i think it could be if if you all haven't seen either one of those um it might be really nice to just sort of see what that what they're doing and kind of how they're enforcing and and supporting folks um and Tisha, feel free to uh, not have me, but but I see Mindy has her hand up. <laughs> Thank you. I have been at the Wild Cat House. I spent two hours touring and talking to the team members there and meeting a few of the residents. And I walked away impressed. I uh, felt a, a deeper understanding that um, there are rules in place to keep people safe. Um, those rules are, uh, are uh, they, they work with people towards those rules. It's sort of helping. So some people who like the substance use, you can keep it in your room, but you're not allowed to use on the outside of your room. Like that's pretty clear and doable. Um, 
I don't didn't ask if there was a one, two, three, you're out. I don't either that I can't answer, but I would um people are provided lots of support in the at the housing first at the Wildcat House. I have to turn my camera off. I cannot talk and see myself there. <laughs> um, uh, the everyone was so very much at ease, and everybody, you know, there's there was a whole. This was an encampment that sort of moved over there together, so people knew one another. Um, and I think that you know, overall, there was just a tremendous amount of this feeling of support of people being successful was my impression. And I really was a bit skeptical about housing first and not not anymore. Um, people who have mental health uh, issues, disorders can be symptomatic. However, they found, you know, it's a lot of the literature that I read that once people get stabilized in a housing first um, uh, apartment or placement, they, they start to do better. They use less. The mental health sort of gets more gets stabilized. So, um, but I did have another question. Um, Wendy, was that helpful at all? Yes, very much. Thank you, Mindy. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, uh, is all the fifty thousand dollars that the city of Tucson received? Uh, for the grant, is that all earmarked already? So I um, feel like this is straying a little from the agenda, um, but okay. I'll, I'll just say um, it's related because there are there have been persons experiencing homelessness at the Tucson that have been placed at the Tucson house. Um, and so I'll just say Yes and no. Um, the the money, the $50 million grant is very prescriptive from HUD in terms of the different categories that can be spent. And in, in our grant application, we we proposed a, a sort of draft of what we what we want to do. HUD is coming next month and we'll have a chance to sort of learn more. It's very possible some of the things we proposed, they'll say, uh-uh, you know, can't do that. That said, um, the, two, the bulk of the money for services, um, it, all of the money for services has to be at the Tucson House, helping Tucson House residents. So the idea, sadly, the idea of, of helping our Housing First program operate the Wildcat Shelter that is a quarter mile away isn't allowable for the grant. So. So it's not all it's not all spoken for because we intentionally left um, some funding unbudgeted for the Tucson House because we need to do a new needs assessment. As Mike knows well, we didn't feel like we had a, a, enough information to really build out the services of the Tucson House without doing a better needs assessment of Tucson House residents. Um, but sadly, it's pretty prescriptive. Looks like Joe has a question. Yeah, I was just going to um, re-ask something from, from last time. We had asked Brandy about uh, homeless protocol and uh, what percentage of calls got placed into what tiers. I think that was actually a Mindy question, but uh, you know, there's the different the difference. There's the tier one, tier two, tier three kind of things for, for homeless protocol. And uh, Brandy wasn't quite sure what the breakdown was. And I think one of the general concerns is that, um, you know, if everything ends up in in a certain tier, then we're just using the homeless protocol to end up doing sweeps on everything. And that's, of course, not what we want. Um, so uh, kind of the, the question was, do we do we have a breakdown of what percentage of uh, those go to what tier? I don't, um, and I just took a note and feel like this is something we can absolutely get back to you on. Um, and if it's, if we want, I know Ernesto, you're making the, um, the agenda for the commission, the full commission, if this is something we want to touch on briefly next week so that we get you an answer sooner than later and you're not waiting until next month, we can do that. 
yeah, I think it was just a question that had, had been outstanding. So if it's addressed next week, awesome. If it's not, if you can't come up with it next week, then we get to it next week. Mike. Yes, thank you. I will try to move quickly. Um, so so the 50 mil, just for clarification, because I'm always trying to make sure I, I understand things so that when I'm telling somebody else, I'm saying the right stuff. So the 50 mil was for the Thrive area, right, in total. And the, the three basic legs of the stool I've been describing is community, workplace, and uh, work for, was it community, economic development? Oh, crime and safety, right? Those are the three basics. So... Good question. Um, and I actually feel like while you're talking, um, I can I can pull up a diagram. So thrive in so here's how I would describe it. Thrive in the 05, Mike, those are the three big initiatives. One is choice neighborhoods, and and that one I'll I'll unpack a little more. And then workforce development, working with um, Pima Community College, you know, economic workforce development. And that third tier was the ASU community health, you know, the community safety, community-based crime, community, CBCR, community-based crime reduction grant. So yes, those were the three stools uh, and are the three stools of Thrive, but the choice grant, so the housing grant that HCD got, there are sort of three other stools to that grant. <laughs> okay. Um, and those three stools are housing, like in particular, the target housing site, the Tucson house, though we, we also have three additional housing sites. So housing make will make up over half of the grant. And then neighborhood projects will make up um, a little less than um, that's 15% of the grant. And then services will make up about 15% of the grant, a little more, actually more like, I don't know. I have to look at the numbers. But so housing, neighborhood improvements and services for Tucson house residents is what the 50 million can go towards. Okay. Um, in regards to like maybe possible tours again of the Wildcat Inn and uh, Amazon, if I'm eligible, I'd like to be on that list uh, just so I can catch up and get updated. Um, when, when you were talking about trying to get more more grants and funding, um, just off the top of your head, real quick, if you can, which ones are running out on you first that you can think of? Like, yeah. So, and really appreciate Jason Thorpe's brain in terms of weaving the funding we do have together. But so here are fundings. So I'll I'll describe um, Wildcat in and sort of how some of the funding for that unfolded. Um, the vast majority is the state and local fiscal recovery funding, ARPA funding. So that's the funding we use to purchase. And that is the funding that makes up a lot of the operations. However, um, there are funding deadlines. And so we have to, and won't go into all of the details there, but there's a big deadline the end of 2024 and then all of the funding needs to be spent by 2026. So that's sort of a funding cliff, the ARPA funding running out in 2026 is, is a big deal because that's where the bulk of the operations comes from. But with the Wildcat, there's also other funding. So um, there's something, the ARPA funding, government funding, federal funding, really prescriptive, couldn't do a lot of the things we had been wanting to do. So that's where we applied for an Arizona Department of Housing um, homeless grant called Project Gateway. And that's where able to do things like the shower trailer and sort of some additional um, things that are harder to fund with the federal funding. So similar with um, Nights in, Nights in, we funded with three different funding sources to purchase it. But my understanding is much of what the county's funding, what much of the program they're doing is also ARPA funding. So those are um, a couple funding sources. We've also used the CARES Act had some coronavirus, some CDBG coronavirus money, and some emergency solutions grant CV money. And those are not, we're now at a point where we have to, those are dwindling down as well. So sort of everything's based on 
this temporary funding that was um, both the local government and the state government got. And so trying to continue to figure out, and good news though is the state has a few other funding sources, um, both through this year's budget, they passed a, uh, I can't remember exactly, it's like housing and homeless services. It's $60 million, but that's statewide. But we, we did get a little over 3 million of, of the 20 million. So they've only allocated 20 million, 40 million they have left to allocate um, for this year, for this year's budget cycle. And then separate from that, they have the housing trust fund where they put 150 million and, and they're, they may end up opening that up. They're still deciding exactly what will be eligible for that 150 million. So those are some, some potential options, hopefully for the future. I have no idea you kept all in your head. <laughs> it's just, wow. Okay. <laughs> And then, so then lastly, so um, I, I assume there are people currently in Amazon Motel, right? There are. Okay. And then that one building you were just describing slightly the, where you had the four bedrooms in the one place, is that, uh, is that something you're going to or is that active now? So we don't own, so that was a low income housing tax credit project. Um, and I don't actually know, um, I don't know Tisha or Neto if you know who owned, I just saw an, another email about this. Um, I don't know who owned it, but whoever owns it is going, is interested in selling and going through the process so that it will no longer be affordable housing. Huh. And usually they're not cheap in terms of like it's hard to to purchase those because they're worth they're worth more money than than nonprofits and government agencies usually can make work. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So. Yeah. You know, depending upon um, when the retreat is, I actually think that you raised a couple of things that would be a good opportunity for the retreat to discuss and maybe put some thought around and some good discourse. Um, we actually still don't have like a myth in our goals, which I'm waiting on the retreat to kind of help us carve that path. So I think, you know, a lot of what's happening here are questions people are just interested in knowing about. Um, but I do think that perhaps this subcommittee um, in the retreat to discuss some of the things that you suggested as maybe a goal to help, you know, just a thought process or, you know, getting us educated or bringing together other um, models from other municipalities on some of these same issues that are happening and potential solutions um, that might assist the Housing First program and in, in working through these. Um, but I know, of course, LIHTC in the 15 year out is something that nationwide communities are struggling with. Um, I'm sure there's gotta be some thought process around it in other municipalities um, that we could maybe seek out as a subcommittee. That's just a consideration. Um, I also think that there there could be a lot of uh, interesting discourse around funding, funding opportunities, um, and partnerships, right? Um, you know, nonprofits are in, in some respects in better positions that they have diversified revenue sources um, for some of these sustainability um, issues that they're raising. Any other questions? It just... Tisha, I really appreciate that thinking in terms of um, your, you know, nonprofits diversified funding sources and that to, you know, we saw a need, created the Housing First program, expanded the Housing First program because the needs there and the funding sources are there. And we can't, you know, we know that there are community partners that might be suited longer term to do a lot of this work. And so Hopefully we can sort of think through that more. You did bring up what you just said made me think I should, I failed to mention a couple other 
things that we're working again i'm i'm real cautious as somebody that wants to think about i don't want to hire people that we're going to have to let go in in a couple of years but we are working on the, the fire station eight which will be a combination of a congregate shelter and a micro shelter tiny home village um, and ideally also a day use where folks folks who need us a, a place and resources can go so, so that's another thing. I think it's, everybody wants us to have it up tomorrow, but due to trying to get the congregate shelter piece, the actual fire station rehabilitated and create the zoning for the micro shelter, it's, it's still going to be a little while, but actively working on that. And then you've likely seen or heard mayor and council continuing to say, they understand that uh, the Housing First program has been great, but we, but in order to make a bigger difference, we also have to look at some other solutions as well. So really pushing us to, to open up a con another con congregate shelter. So we're actively looking for spots to that would be appropriate to open another congregate shelter. Um, and so open to ideas and suggestions there and um, again, I am nervous about long-term funding in terms of opening these up, operating them, um, but just should have mentioned that those are other big things on the horizon for the city's Housing First program. Mindy. Thank you. Um, I've been looking at a property for the last three years, four years, the um, it used to be the Tucson Heart Hospital located across from Sam's Club on um, uh, Stone and River. Um, it has been empty for quite some time. It's owned by Tenant, which is a for-profit insurance company. The building uh, is set up in a their, their private private rooms with a bathroom that is shared with two rooms. It, it's, it would make such a remarkable housing first uh, venue. There's a large amount of land near it um, for people who may not be ready to move inside, could set up tents if they need, want to. Uh, there, let, has commercial kitchen, it could lend it. So I just programmatically, I'm already, I've been drooling. So uh, just an idea. I'll be, I'm done. I, I appreciate that. I'm trying to find it on a map and make sure it's in the city as right there, it's a little, right at Stone and River, there are some parcels in the city and some that aren't. Um, and so happy to, I'm, I'd be love to hear more Mindy in terms of exactly where it is. And if you said it's vacant right now. It has been vacant for years. And I, um, they're, they're wanting $6 million for it. Um, however, there may be ways to, negotiate that is it uh, is it north of river it's south of river, south of river. carondelet um imaging center is right north of it it's right it's on a bus line it's less i think not a, even a mile from a grocery store so it fits a lot of the hud requirements for housing first okay Thank you. I'll I'll take a look. And do you have any contacts of anyone there that you said you might? Okay. No. Um, I'm trying to find. Ooh, no. Okay. Thank you. I may may pick your brain in terms of looking at a map. Oh. <laughs> Clearly, because it's been closed down, I can't find. Oh, wait, no. It could. Ooh, I think I found it. Horticulture could happen there. 
horticulture therapy, food could be grown. People have outside space. There's meeting rooms, conference rooms. People, it would be more housing first and permanent supported housing because it's not. Okay, thank you. And you can pick my brain as much as you are because I've sort of already. Is it right on river? It's right south. It's on stone. It's like it's almost the southeast corner of Stone and River, if it's the one I'm um, thinking about. Like 4900 North Stone would probably be about the address. Yeah, so it's near the intersection of River and Stone, and it is the southeast corner. Yeah. That, that property. And it is like blocks north of the uh, the transit center there, come to think of it. Yes, the bus station is right there. Yeah. Um, the Tohono Tadai Transit Center. And Walmart is right around the corner and Sprouts and it's, I think they should, they need to donate it to the city, the building and a couple of million to renovate it. Talk them into it. Okay. I if, if we'll we'll pay for the renovations if they want to donate. The... <laughs> um, yeah. Well, thank you. And if anyone else thinks of any other locations, um, you know that's definitely something we'll explore. Um, Jason, Jason's theory is any of the abandoned, um, any of the closed Walgreens could serve as a congregate shelter since they're not doing anything else right now. Um, so we're open. I think to me, knowing someplace that for not so much money, we can make sure that it's a decent place with showers and bathrooms. Um, two is being mindful of sort of location and, and maybe having it not be tucked in a neighborhood. But like something like this location, Mindy, I think is great in terms of it's not it's not next to a, a neighborhood, but is more on somewhere with good transit access. And then um, three is of course affordability, and we're we're looking at possibly um, either renting it or purchasing it. We're looking at both options in terms of a little nervous long term. Um, so trying to look at both options. Uh, and I will try to find the people that are the ones to talk to about donating it. I will work on that. Right. Anyone else have questions for Ian? All right, well, thank you, Anne, so much for spending your time with us yeah. today. Let us, let us know about the book club, if it's open to others. Hey, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so the next meeting will be, there's uh, next meetings will be September 26th and October 31st, and the full commission meeting is September 7th. Um, and I think with that, that's the last agenda item, um, and we are adjourned. Thank you all so much for coming with us today, meeting with Thank us you. today. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right, bye bye.